All right, hi everyone. I just messed up the intro again, two weeks in a row, um, but I forgot which episode this is. It's either episode six or seven. Today we have Meredith, Chaput, and Bailey going over NMES and proprioceptive training for ACL reconstruction uh, patients. So Meredith and Bailey will introduce themselves and still forgot to make you host again. This is going great. All right, now you're officially host, Meredith, and we are good to go. And also, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for having us. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Oh, and while she's sharing her screen, so uh, Meredith has to go near the end of the hour. Um, so if you want to hear more stuff, she's actually going to the live Q&A uh, for ACL day. And the link is in the chat. And you just want to directly click there to go over. No hard feelings if you guys leave here early to go see her talk more. All good. Okay, so can y'all see that? Okay, I can't really see anybody else. I can only see a couple people at a time. So if you can't or something goes crazy, just unmute yourself. Also, please stop me in the middle of this. I get really excited and I ramble. So if you have questions or anything, just stop um, and then same same with like during Bailey's stuff just like let us know what you have questions with um this is whatever we're here to get the most benefit out of it for you so and provide you with resources um so today we're going to talk about NMES and proprioception training after ACLR and this is um a area that I'm really passionate about and we were talking um, a little bit earlier about how my goal for this is just to provide like a 30,000 foot view of why we potentially need this um, training. And then Bailey's going to dig into the actual methodology and like, how are you going to implement it? Okay, so hang with me for a little bit of the background. And then Bailey's going to give you all the expertise on like what you need to know and how to use it. Okay, or like why you should be using it. Oh. So I just wanna say thank you to uh, Vien for having me today, Bailey for putting up with me and collaborating with me on this. And then all of you for coming and also watching and providing feedback as we go along. So like I just said, this is going to be a big overview of pathophysiology of ACL injuries. Overall, how do we integrate sensory information, um, whole brain changes briefly after ACL, and then we're going to focus in on quad inhibition and proprioceptive training. So just to introduce myself a little bit, I did undergrad at the University of Minnesota Duluth and I studied exercise science. Um, I decided to become a physical therapist because of my own in past knee injuries and being unable to get myself back into physical capacity to play college athletics. And so I did PT school at Creighton University and I graduated there in 2018. And while I was there, I studied a lot of clinical outcomes after ACL reconstruction, such as like strength testing and hop testing and just patient reported outcomes under Terry Grindstaff. At the end of PT school, I was kind of at this crossroads of PhD or do I want to do a residency? And I knew I was really passionate about research, but I didn't feel I had the clinical experience or knowledge to really match up with my research interests. And so I pursued residency and I was fortunate to go to Vanderbilt and I learned a ton while I was there, but I potentially learned more about what I didn't know when I was in residency versus what I actually thought that I knew. And it was in residency where I gained the independence to kind of dive into motor learning and reconnect with the neurologic side of physical therapy that I was really passionate about. And that ultimately ended up with um, me pursuing a PhD at Ohio University with my current advisor, Dr. Dustin Grooms. And so my research interests really align with cognitive processing and specifically visual processing and how does that integrate into movement. So to give an overarching view of what happens after musculoskeletal injury, 
Specifically, we're going to talk about the ACL, but you can equate this to any ligament injury. You have a ligament injury, which results in mechanoreceptor sensory organ disruption, mechanical instability of that joint, and then pain. So surgery aims to restore the mechanical instability of that joint. And you tend to have resolution of pain throughout rehabilitation and recovery. However, the mechanoreceptor disruption here is what really is a bugger and we don't get that back. No matter how hard we try, it doesn't fully return. So clinically, this manifests as central nervous system reorganization. So we see altered motor output, altered reflexes, different types of motor control and movement patterns, or even like just like volitional, volitional movement or volitional muscle activity. So specifically after ACL rupture, we have the mechanoreceptors within the ACL that are, that are disconnected, right? They no longer talk to the central nervous system. This results in massive quad muscle inhibition, which can be seen on the right-hand side in this picture. You guys have all kind of encountered this. And then ultimately altered motor coordination. And we see this with altered gait patterns or altered like even like functional, functional movements such as like squats, cutting, those types of things. Um, but what we can't see in rehab is all of these other hidden factors. We see, in specific to the quad, we see decreased muscle mass, right? And despite our ability to maybe regain circumference of the quad or volume of the quad after an ACL reconstruction, we have all of these hidden factors that are relating to both muscle atrophy as well as neurologic inhibition. And so if you guys are interested in kind of diving into the atrophy component of quad, quad inhibition and quad weakness and pro protracted recovery of muscle atrophy, I highly suggest looking at Dr. Lindsay Lepley's work from the University of Michigan. But, to understand why, why we see these quadriceps deficits um, from strictly a central nervous system perspective, we're going to first look at ACL injury as a whole and then kind of funnel through um, whole brain changes down to the spinal cord level of what's going on with inhibition. So how do their brain encode and plan for movement? I want you to pretend like you're Steph Curry. Okay, Draymond Green is coming up and he's going to set you a screen. You're trying to make a decision. Do I drive to the basket? Is Draymond going to roll, right? Is the defender going to come over the top or slip underneath the screen? And this Steph in this instance is doing 15 plus cognitive motor dual tasks to make one decision, right? To, to put the ball in the hoop is what his goal is. And think about your rehabilitation. Um, at any point in it, I would argue that we do very little cognitive motor dual tasking. And the issue with this comes very early in ACL rehabilitation, day one, after when you have your patient in the clinic and you're having them do a quad set. You tell them, you put the foam roll or you put something towel roll underneath their knee and you tell them to stare at their knee and try to contract as hard as you can. And this doesn't necessarily relate to the activity that we need to be able to do in sport because we're not thinking about our muscle contractions while we're out or we're out on the court or out on the field. So this kind of gets into the ACL. I'm not going to get into this much, but the ACL sensory motor error. And so there's research and there's actually a case study to suggest that quadriceps inhibition begins before the injury mechanism. And sometimes this video plays and sometimes it doesn't. But so this video is two rugby players who sustained an ACL injury on the same day. The first one's difficult to see. He's kind of going after the ball and he just cuts and plants wrong. This next one, however, you can see that he's kind of gazing into the environment. He's trying to juke out his defenders. He literally just plants and he's toast. This next angle is a little bit better. And so I would honestly argue that there was just actually a paper that came out on this, I think 
this a couple weeks ago about the angles of cutting. He had a wide cut angle, right? That puts you at higher risk for load on the ACL, but there was nothing that happened here that I probably would not train in rehab. There was very little valgus collapse here. And you can obviously tell that that was his mechanism that he naturally used to cut over and over again. But you can see in the injury mechanism, it's almost like his nervous system just fails him, right? So there are some case or a case study to suggest that central activation ratio to the quadriceps is, is diminished before an ACL injury occurs. But this is something that we're, we're not sure of entirely. So after, after you sustain this injury, um, what happens to your sensory integration ability? So you use three systems to integrate sensory information from the environment. You have proprioception or somatosensory input, vestibular, and vision. After you sustain an ACL injury, to be overly dramatic, the system is gone, right? It, it doesn't work anymore from that ligament. Let's say you're more reliant on the other ligaments or muscles and tendons around the joint to provide proprioceptive information. And you become overly reliant on these two systems. So the issue with this is that now I become visually dependent for movement and I become visually dependent on how I detect where my joint is in space. This also becomes problematic when we think about quad inhibition and how we think about contracting our quadriceps in the clinic. So to kind of look at the changes that occur while doing like a quadriceps contraction or a submaximal contraction, we can do this uh, a variety of ways. Our lab uses fMRI, where we measure the hemodynamic response of blood flow to the brain while somebody is contracting their quadriceps. And so as neuronal activity increases, blood flow increases to that area, and then we can tell what areas of the brain individuals are activating. Based, based upon this factor. And what we get are images as such where we can e either tell what areas they're activating during a task or um, do certain analyses to figure out what may be associated with other subscales such as strength output or um, patient reported outcome measures. So overall, um, the research in whole brain activity really depicts vast changes that occur in the central nervous system for very simple knee movement or quadriceps contraction. And so this first study was one of Dustin's first that he found increased activation in the motor cortex and the lingual gyrus, which was important for integrating both sensory, somatosensory information, as well as visual information for movement during like a simple short arc quad exercise. The next study by Adam Lepley demonstrated similar findings using fMRI, and they had actually increased frontal cortex activity. And this is, this is interesting because that starts to tap into the cognitive aspect that we were talking about sooner and, and thinking about moving your limb. And then Cody Chris, who is a doctoral student in our lab, did a study where he looked at a, a multi-joint task or a heel slide task. So it was a knee movement instead of just isolated quad. And he also found alterations in the connectivity between regions for visual spatial cognition to do very simple knee movement. So at a, at a very wide level, right, not, not creating maximal voluntary isometric contraction of the quadriceps, we see these alterations for very simple movement. The other factor to quad inhibition and just overall nervous system insult that occurs after ACL injury is that this occurs bilaterally. And so these are just two studies of several that have looked at bilateral contributions of the injury. Um, and the punchline to both of these is that alterations occur at both the spinal and supraspinal levels. Now, nobody besides, well, we, we, just or we just analyzed some data on healthy limb movement from whole brain perspective. And what we found, we did a knee kicking task where they lay in the MRI and they, they do 30 seconds of move as such. And then we contrast it with 30 seconds of rest. 
And what we found was that when individuals move their healthy limb, they have these neural alteration patterns that occur. And specifically in our cohort of individuals, they activated their middle frontal gyrus more. And so this area is really important for knee motor control and movement. And it's a key hub in the interaction of cognition and decision-making for motor planning. So overall, from a whole brain perspective, we see um, changes bilaterally after this injury and, and potentially could be detrimental or, or be a cause of some of the quadriceps issues that we see protracted through rehab. So if we're gonna define quadriceps inhibition, overall neural inhibition is a process that prevents the quad from being fully activated. And when I meet, what I mean by that is recruiting the maximum number of motor units possible within that muscle, okay? For the quadriceps, that's, that's very high. People can recruit, recruit close, healthy individuals can recruit close to all of their motor units, you know, with a, with a max voluntary isometric contraction. Um, over after an ACL injury, depending on the studies that you look at, individuals, despite returning to return to play and full rehab and having really good strength output, might only be able to, um, might only be able to contract 80, 85 percent of their motor unit. So despite being able to functionally return to sport, there's this invisible inhibition almost that I'm going to call it that we see. And so specific in early stages, we see arthrogenic muscle inhibition, and it's caused by changes in the discharge of sensory receptors from the damaged knee joint. So that sensory receptors is kind of the key term here. It's not um, an alpha motor neuron issue for say, it's a sensation issue. So this is a figure that I really like from the article that VN um, pointed out or should have sent out. And I'm not going to walk through all of this, but what I think this figure does is a really good job of um, depicting the complexity of muscle inhibition. And we as therapists have a lot of issues that we're trying to deal with to combat this problem. And so the other thing is that we, we see both um, spinal pathways that are affected by like the flexion reflex, 1B inhibition or gamma loop, which is the most common, common cause or the most commonly studied cause of inhibition. But then we also have these supraspinal influences. And so we're going to kind of focus on gamma loop or like spinal reflex excitability and then what happens at the motor cortex um, when a quad is inhibited. So just to review a spinal reflex real quick, we're talking about the monosynaptic reflex that occurs such as that of a deep tendon reflex. Okay, so when you do your traditional patellar tendon reflex, this is an assessment of the muscle spindles of the quadriceps. Okay, not the Golgi tendon organs, it's the muscle spindles of the quadriceps. And so what this does is it causes a stretch of like the blue, blue muscle spindle neuron here, okay? That's your 1A afferent that goes into your dorsal root ganglion into the posterior cord of your spinal cord. It's gonna synapse on the alpha motor neuron in the anterior horn that causes contraction of your quadriceps, okay? That's how you kick out. It also causes inhibition through an interneuron on your hamstring. So it causes reflexes it, reflexive inhibition to the hamstring to be able to um, promote this reflex. And so this is what we study using electrical impulse in therapy to determine if somebody's spinal reflex excitability is adequate after ACL injury. The other pathway we study is cortical spinal tract. And so this is the tract that goes from your primary motor cortex, okay? It travels down through your pyramidal tracts, it crosses at your caudal medulla, and then it goes to the spinal cord level at which it is, synapses on the motor neuron, and then out to the muscle it goes, okay? So these are the two systems that we study mainly. And 
Um, the important thing about this one is that when you describe the cortical spinal tract or we measure it in research, we're measuring the integrity of the entire system. That's including both upper motor neurons going from the cortex, but it includes the spinal cord as well. And that reflex that almost that reflex that we just talked about. So ultimately an H reflex as defined in like research articles is electrically induced spinal reflex by stimulating the femoral nerve. So in general, it's going to measure the excitability of the alpha motor neuron pool that's innervating the quadriceps. And what we see after ACL reconstruction is, is a bit conflicting actually. So in late stages, so this can be greater than 24 months, even at the time of return to sport, we see these individuals have increased H reflexes. Okay, so have increased spinal excitability. However, early in rehabilitation, particularly in the first um, six months or so when you're seeing them most in rehab, this is decreased, it's diminished. So it's a, a big cause or a bugger that can kind of preclude your, your strength gains in rehab, okay? So we start off diminished around six months, they become symmetric. And then late in rehab, they're either symmetric or they tend to be hyper excitable. Now, when we talk about the motor cortex, okay, there's a lot of different metrics that you guys see in the literature um, that can get confusing. But when we talk about specifically motor cortex activity, we're thinking about like TMS. And so TMS um, uses an electro or it's a magnetic coil over the motor cortex. It's going to cause a magnetic current that stimulates neurons and causes depolarization down the cortical spinal tract. And then we measure with an electrode at the quadriceps um, how, how long and how large that response takes, okay? And so when we talk about motor threshold, or you see that in literature, you can do that either at rest or active where you're doing just an isometric contraction of the quadriceps. And essentially this is the lowest setting possible that TMS uses to create a muscle response or to evoke a response. MEP or MEP or motor evoked potential assesses the entire integrity of this tract. And so it's administered similarly, but at a larger, um, larger intensity. And the thing that's difficult in the literature is MEP is highly variable depending on lab and who administers it. So it's hard to compare these variables, but motor threshold and active motor threshold is, is pretty accurate across research studies. So what we see from strictly the motor cortex after ACL injury is that we have an increased active motor threshold. In other words, more neurons or more activity is needed, more juice is needed to the system in the motor cortex to create a quadriceps muscle response. As far as mean or MEP goes, um, the results are, are mixed depending on the method of analysis, but overall the consensus is that we have this reduced excitability of the cortical spinal pathways um, that requires larger neural activation to create a muscle response. And that's some of that that's in line with what we see um, in our whole brain neural data as well. And then on the right, this is a graph that um, is in Bodkin et al. And he looked at active motor threshold as it was correlated with peak knee extensor torque. And what he found was that individuals who had greater inhibition or, or required more neural activity, let's say, to evoke a motor response, demonstrated lower peak torque values. So what, what do we know currently about what's happening at the spinal cord or cortical levels that are um, contributing to quad inhibition? It's probably at both. It's at spinal and cortical levels, and it probably depends on the time in which they're at in their recovery. Um, early on in rehab, it's probably more spinal mediated. 
And then later on, it's probably more cortically mediated. So this is my plea for quad strength early on. And Bailey's gonna hit on this a ton. But if you don't know where the clinical practice guideline is, I highly suggest Googling JOSBT clinical practice guidelines. Um, the current recommendation is to use NMES for quadriceps strength for six to eight weeks in your rehabilitation. Um, and the caveat to this is we need to probably be assessing strength to know how our patient is doing. So if you don't have access to an isokinetic dynamometer, there's other methods such as handheld dynamometry, one rep MAC knee extension, or even there's single leg squat tests that you can make quadriceps bias to try um, to, to augment this. So Bailey is gonna talk all about the application of NMES in a second, but I just wanna to touch briefly on proprioception. And so proprioception is the ability to integrate somatosensory information to detect joint movement and position. And so again, we're still looking at this sensory error or this sensory disruption that we see after ACL reconstruction. And the two main types of proprioception that we think about or that we tend to use as clinicians are stationary sense, which is just detecting where the joint is in space. And you can do this actively or passively. And so actively would be like, you have somebody sitting on a table or, or sitting at the end, end of your plinth, you have them extend their knee actively out to 45 degrees and then pause. You say, remember where that joint location is and then they rest and then they try to rematch that. Passive would be, okay, I as the clinician grab their knee, pull them out to the joint angle that I want. You say, okay, remember where that joint angle was, return them back to rest, and then repeat that. Okay, and you tell them, okay, tell me, tell me when to stop when you think you're at that same angle. And then you measure the difference. The issue with that sort of assessment is that, I think I have a picture here. So the issue with this sort of assessment is that it's very cognitive related, okay? You're, you're, all you're doing is you're telling the patient to cognitively think about where their joint is in space, but that's not how your body uses proprioceptive information. That's not how your brain integrates proprioceptive inter information. So overall, when you look, dive into the literature on is there proprioceptive deficits after ACL injury, the results are very inconsistent because we're inconsistent at the angles in which we measure them and we're inconsistent at the method in which we measure them. And honestly, I don't know that we have a really great way to directly measure this system yet clinically. So we were interested in looking at overall what, what is the contribution of neural activity to proprioception or, or to maintain function in these aspects? And what we found was that somebody's proprioceptive error, somebody who had better proprioception also had better visual memory capacity, okay? So this directly relates to how, how we assess this in the clinic by using your visual memory to detect where your joint is in space. Now, when somebody does a double leg jump to single leg landing, which is a dynamic proprioceptive task, essentially, we see that somebody who has better visual motor capacity is able to stabilize faster, okay? So we still see that there's, there's a necessary visual component that helps to augment um, their performance on these two clinical assessments. When we look at their neural activity that's associated um, with their visual memory and visual motor function, we see a region in the um, precuneus that is of higher activation in ACLR individuals than um, in healthy controls. And so what this means is that potentially ACL people activate regions in their brain that are important for visual and sensory integration to maintain function on proprioception 
and stability assessments that we can use clinically, okay? Now, the whole goal of our rehab is to make sure this doesn't happen. We want people, we're not just trying to restore physical function, we're trying to restore neurologic function as well to them, okay? But obviously our, our interventions that we're using and in the current state of which these individuals are being recovered, we still see these vast neurologic deficits. So overall, from all of this so far, what, what, do we, what do we know? We know that there's widespread alterations in whole brain neural activity, okay? There's altered cortical spinal activation, probably more so in the late stages of rehabilitation. We have altered spinal reflex activity, probably more so in the early stages of rehabilitation. And then the overall ability for somebody after ACL reconstruction to maintain proprioception um, is probably related or could be related to their visual memory capacity to do so. So how, Bailey's gonna focus on how do we address these top three in her section, okay? I'm gonna give you some intervention ideas for number four. So in order to improve proprioception or to improve somatosensory integration after an injury, we need to focus on that system. So we said earlier that people rely more on the vestibular system and vision and rehab. So we need to try to reweight or upweight the central nervous system to use more proprioception. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. We can't do that using compliant surfaces. So think about how you use compliant surfaces with your best test or your sit seb in neurologic rehab, okay? Or when you're gonna do a concussion evaluation. You put somebody on a foam surface to take away somatosensory input, okay? And it reweights them to use vestibular or vision. So if I have somebody single leg stance on an AirX pad, and then I have them close their eyes, I'm saying, okay, the most likely sensory resource they're going to use to balance is vestibular. So this is probably the last thing we should be doing in rehab early on to promote sensory integration of somatic sensation. Okay, that's not to say we need to throw these out entirely. If you need more challenges, that kind of stuff, I get it. Um, but early on in rehab, like when you're still working on single leg stance with weight shifts and things, this should not be your go-to intervention. Instead, I challenge you to try to challenge your other systems, okay? So you want to upweight some out of sensation, so you need to downweight or even visually distract vestibular and vision in your rehabilitation interventions, okay? We can do that several ways. First one, probably the easiest way is through neurocognitive challenges, okay? So you're on a stable surface, you're on a hard surface, and you can give them working memory tasks. You can give them visual targets to search, even like your traditional ball tosses. All of that is fantastic to do, okay? Because they're not able to think about where their knee is in space cognitively, and they're not able to visually attend to that location as well, okay? The other thing we can use is stroboscopic glasses, which are like flashy glasses that um, cause, cause different levels of opacity. And so this is one of my athletes at Vanderbilt, and she was actually like nine months out of her ACL reconstruction when I got a hold of her. And, um, as you can see, she was not very great at this task when you put the glasses on her, but she could do it very fluently without the glasses. Another consideration she used in therapy is like virtual reality or Google Cardboard. And if you have any questions on that, you can, you can devote them to VN because he's the, he's the virtual reality master. But no, but seriously, like these are $20 cardboard things that you can just go to YouTube VR on your smartphone. And we use like a roller coaster app that in our lab all the time for a vestibular input. 
And so it's really cool about these. It's just on your smartphone. You literally slide it in the box, put it on. And what we find in our research is that putting people in virtual reality causes a larger perturbation than like foam and eyes closed or foam and strobe glasses plus, a, plus another dual task. Like virtual reality adds an entire other element because it perturbs the vestibular system, but it also perturbs the visual system because you don't have horizontal on your vision to be able to stabilize peripherally. So it's like the maximum or the, or the best way to really reweight to somatic sensation that we have seen thus far. And so just other, other ideas of um, exercises util utilizing motor and learning principles um, that can be impl implemented. So here are a couple of VR scenarios. Sorry, the video quality is not fantastic. But in this one, we have the gal doing straight leg raises. This would be a fantastic exercise to do with NMES on that she didn't have to look at her quad while she did it. And then she's kicking a soccer ball. So when the ball comes to her, she performs a straight leg raise and kicks it, okay? And then this is an example of um, a video. So you can find a lot of these videos on YouTube as well, where you might have, if your athlete's a skier, right? You can put them in virtual reality. You can put them in parallel bars, even if you're just doing weight shifts. And your cue to them can be, okay, I want you to weight shift around the flags as if you were like skiing down the slope. So all of that to just kind of summarize and say there's ways that we can challenge the proprioceptive system and there are a lot of whole brain neural activity changes that we see after ACL reconstruction, right, that our current therapies aren't necessarily, um, aren't necessarily targeting. But if you guys have any specific questions on like intervention specific, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I want Bailey to be able to get to her part. I'm gonna make her the host. Hey, thanks Meredith. Um, I'm gonna ask you a few questions just cause I think you might be the best to answer these ones. Um, and Bailey, you got plenty of time. If people wanna leave before or uh, like after at the hour, that's fine. We usually upload this anyway, so it's not a big concern. Um, but the first question uh, was Chris had was, when we talk about the decreased excitability before the injury, is that being carried over uh, after surgery or is it because of surgery too? Like what, what are, what's the, how does that happen, I guess? And Chris, you can clarify. If yeah, I mean, Meredith, I, I guess my question is, is like, is that, excitability dampening is that a sequelae from the surgery or are we are you thinking that that's probably a cause of the <clears throat> because to your point i agree there's there's something going on like you said like the ner your nervous system is failing you like it's not a it's not a force tolerance thing because they've done this before but something happens yeah. like same thing in sprinters too right like these proximal hamstring injuries like you've done this before but why now? It's like you're something is failing, and I don't think it's the tissue. No, I mean, obviously the tissue is the damage, but yeah, right. I'm 100% with you. So there's, to my knowledge, there's one documented case study where this gal was going to be a healthy control in the research study. She <laughs> went in literally that day. I think she, I think it was a soccer player, went in that day, had all of her neuro tests done. Right, they were doing like H reflex, car, all that stuff. And she had decreased, decreased central activation ratio compared to what healthy would be, right? Literally hours later, she tore her ACL. Oh and so um, this isn't, normally we don't get people in to do all these neurologic tests, right? We do not have data capacity in this manner to say like, okay, is this actually happening beforehand? Because the odds of us getting people two hours or even weeks or days before their ACL injury is not there either, right? But to well, that we're end, really testing, right? Like, we're yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, so that's really that's a unique case. But to that end, like, 
it's, it's not recovered. And um, individuals who have less swelling, who have less of, you know, all the inhibition components early tend to do better later on, right? But we don't even understand the biochemical reasons why those individuals, some, somebody swells up really bad, but somebody doesn't, Yeah. you know? And so it's all of those components that go into it. Um, yeah, it's just a sticky question. Well, with that, with that case study, would you enter, I'm like, would you have intervened in the same manner that you described in your presentation? Like if you put this person through this neurologic assessment and found this kind of dampened excitability, would the answer be the same or would, I mean, because I guess it's a hypothetical question. Yeah. But. No, I think that that's, I think that that's like the exact mindset though. And I, I don't know, right. Because you yeah. think that all these healthy people have a certain amount of variability, right? right. So it's like that, that could just be her. You know, but if it was off side to side, you're like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, am I going to hook her up to NMES? Probably not because, you know, you're like, what is this going to help? It's a, that's a, that's almost like a, a fool to the system, right? Because you're contracting peripherally, but it's a central issue that we're having. It's not a peripheral issue. Right. So, so I don't know. Could you get limb asymmetries if it's a central if it's a central issue? Then the comparison has got to be to age, gender. I mean, yeah. like sex norms, right? Like, I mean, I guess that's the only thing we yeah. could do. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm I'm 100 with you on that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. This is awesome, Meredith. It's great to see you. It's good to see you too. Thanks for coming. Sure. Meredith, right, uh, my question was for extra prescription of using a cognitive load. So how do we determine intensity? Is it okay to have someone look really challenged on the motor task um, because they're struggling with the cognitive task? Like, I don't know how to give them a difficult molar task versus a, a difficult cognitive task. I think, yeah. Um, so that's tough. So that's where you have to use your clinical judgment and like you, number one is patient safety first, right? So like if the cognitive task is really impeding their physical performance you either need a different cognitive task or they're not ready for that physical load that you have them at um so that's always like my first go-to my second one is I like to use just like RPE and I like to physically ask the person like is this cognitive task too hard for you there's actually a scale top called like the I think it's the NASA TLX that has like a physical load. It's literally visual analog scale and it has a vi visual or a cognitive demand and a physical demand, right? And they literally just mark it, they circle it. And so that's an easy way for you to even gauge like, okay, if continually my cognitive load is here, but my physical load is here, that's, that's usually not what I want. I want somewhere probably in the middle where I'm gonna maximally challenge them or, you know, somewhere in in their physical capability and so those are the two things that I like to use clinically I don't know if that helps your helps your cause at all but the other thing is if I'm trying to build muscle strength right if my goal for the session is like I want to get this person to like lift heavy I'm not going to have them serial subtract while they're lifting okay that's not the goal that's not the goal of this cognitive load comes with like sub max exercises um i think that's also a common misconception so i like to just get that out there is i'm not telling people to like do stroop tests while they have 200 pounds on their back let's not do that but like when i'm doing single leg squats with no way early on in rehab especially like there's no reason why i shouldn't be doing some other task at the same time because now that's a motor control exercise for the most part Meredith, do you think there's value in doing some of these tasks between injury and surgery in that prehab phase when we know that they have ligament damage and swelling and inflammation in the joint? So my first concern, and I'll say this all the time, is as a clinician, your responsibility is to do what we know now is helpful, and that's getting full range of motion back, get your quad activation and get rid of the swelling. Those are your responsibilities before surgery. 
right? If research comes out that like, hey, I can put somebody in VR and it helps with their quad activity and such, like maybe that can be an adjunct to your rehab. But in right now and in like the near future, as far as research goes, between surgery and or between injury and surgery, those are the three components that we need to get really good at. Because I don't know that we even do a good job at that right now. Thanks, Mary. Someone should really get on that VR research stuff, huh? Somebody, man. No. Uh, is Bailey host right now? You should be. I think so. All right, sounds good. Uh, and Meredith, thank you again. If you got to go, um, don't feel bad or anything for just ditching us, okay? okay I'm going to try to hang out as long as I can, but if not, I appreciate you having me. All right, thanks. Okay, I'm going to try to pull this up here. All right. Can you guys see this okay? It's good. Cool. All right, so that was awesome, Meredith. I could listen to you talk for hours, I feel like. So this is going to dive into more of the clinical applications behind NMES. Um, just as a background for those who don't know me, I just finished up my sports residency at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I went to the University of Wisconsin for both athletic training and PT school, and then I am actually moving back to Wisconsin in May. So that's a little bit of background on me, but let's dive right into this here. So, okay, so does NMES actually work clinically, right? So based on everything we just talked about, I mean, don't disrespect Meredith, don't disrespect this woman right here and tell me that NMES doesn't work, right? Um, so I wanted to look both at the old research to support this, because admittedly I hadn't done a good job reading through those studies, and then fast forward all the way to what we currently know now as far as NMES goes. So first I wanted to look at kind of the old studies from Dr. Snyder Mackler. Um, and the earliest ones that I found on ACLs were from 1991 to 1995. Um, there's a couple different things I just wanted to pull out from these studies, because I think in general, talking to just my coworkers and other people about this, it's something, NMES is something we're just like a little bit uncomfortable with, right, as clinicians. And I don't know if that's just part of my education or if that's kind of an overarching thing. So I just want to pull out different things from each of these studies that were interesting. So in these initial studies on ACL, the NMES was applied for the first six weeks post-operatively. In them, there was four different groups. There was a high intensity group, there was a high intensity volitional exercise, but no NMES, a low intensity NMES, and then a combo of high and low. The main thing that I didn't know as part of these studies was that the application of these were completely passive. So instead of having the person activate with them, it was just you put the NMES on and it just ran through. Um, in addition to this, important to note, they did do progressive rehab three times a week as well. So the NMES was really an adjunct to that, but it was a passive application. And then as I kind of already talked about, just I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with NMES parameters. So I just wanted to point out for this study specifically, they used an AC current uh, 75 bursts per second. And the important thing was that it was the maximum tolerated intensity for each participant each session. So you really, they kept increasing that intensity to get the most benefit of it. And then the last thing that I think is just interesting is it was 11 seconds on and 120 seconds off. So I think if we're thinking about this clinically today, I've never done something with that grade of a work rest ratio. But if you think about 120 seconds, that's about the two minutes that we give for recovery for like a max intensity uh, contraction. So I think that's the rationale behind it, um, but just a little bit different than what at least I see clinically. So what they found in this study, particularly in the first six weeks, was the group who did the passive application of the high intensity NMES uh, achieved 70% limb symmetry. And this was measured by isometric quad uh, contractions with a dynamometer. So that group was statistically significantly better than all other groups. The one that came in second was the high intensity volitional exercise without the NMES, but they only reached 57% by six weeks. And then finally, the low intensity NMES was 51%. So pretty significant difference in range there, but some early evidence to support and kind of jump our research forward. 
So then fast forward in the current day, uh, this is the CPG that Meredith was talking about. And looking on here, the recommendation is level A evidence for six to eight weeks. And I would say, honestly, looking around like my clinic specifically, I'm uh, trying to push this more, but it's, it's being used much less than that. So I think we really need to push for that as a profession. And it is the most current recommendation out there. So that's the CPG. And then this was another one that I found interesting. This was a 2021 systematic review. So it had a little lower level. So they had level B evidence to support the use of it. Um, important to note, there were a variety of different surgeries, not just ACL. So there were ACLs, total knee replacements, and then meniscectomies were what were included. Uh, there were eight studies overall, four out of eight had a moderate to large effect size in support of the NMES. Um, and the range was between two and six weeks post-op. So there were some studies included that only used it for two weeks, which may be why they didn't have such a significant effect in those studies. Um, so then moving into the specific parameters and what's best that way, this is something I really struggled with and I've been trying to get better at as well. So this is the same systematic review I was just talking about. And what they wanted to do is figure out what parameters were mo most efficacious for these people. So uh, as I already touched on, eight studies were included. The average Pedro score was around a five, and only two of them were true randomized control trials. Um, the breakdown was five of them were ACL studies, two of them were total knees, and one was a meniscectomy. The reason I starred the total knees was because these were the two that were truly randomized control trials and had the highest Pedro scores. So again, I think we just have to keep in mind, we are doing a little bit of adaptation of the evidence to different areas, uh, but it's the best that we have out there. So just in this one specifically, that one really was the weights behind this study. Uh, all of them included objectively assessed the quad strength in some way, and then they were not able to do any biofeedback or any co-treatment. That was an exclusion criteria as well. So other limitations to that. So now I kind of want to go into what we know, what we think we know, and what we don't know. So based on the most current evidence out there, NMES should be used consistently for at least two to six weeks and probably eight, honestly, um, based on the CPG that was out in lower extremity surgeries. Um, the effect size becomes significantly greater if you can visibly see the muscle contract when you put on the NMES. So that's another thing to think about as well. In all the studies that had a good effect, the stimulation intensity had to be progressively increased each session. Uh, I do think this is a little tricky and this is hard with some of my patients because a lot of my patients just ask me like what number was I at next time, last time and then go up like two based on that. So like I think to truly be a max tolerate like max, max tolerable intensity, you have to do a ton of patient education as far as that goes um, to really get them to push themselves. And then what they found in the study was biphasic current was what was the best for both patient comfort and for uh, getting true strength gains out of it. I think we all probably know the larger pads are usually more comfortable for the patient just because it decreases your current density. Um, but there was no true difference between using IFC, waveform, Russian, or symmetric biphasic. So those three were kind of all considered okay. It's just whatever the patient liked the best. Um, so then moving into what there's some evidence for, but we don't know for sure. So the frequency should be kept around 50, and I've seen anywhere up to 75 uh, as far as your Hertz goes for your burst modulation. Uh, and that's just to achieve good tetany and promote a smooth contraction. Your phase duration, this has got a pretty wide range. It can be anywhere between 250 and 1,000. Uh, the initial Snyder-Mackler studies had it closer to 2,000, so that's just something to kind of note with this. Uh, and the most recent stuff is showing your on-off ratio should either be 1 to 2 or 1 to 3 to allow for adequate, uh, adequate recovery as well. And that can kind of depend on the fatigue and the discomfort that the patient is having. And then this is something I learned specifically from Meredith and has really kind of been a game changer for me lately. So 60 degrees of knee flexion is where you really can get the most quadriceps torque. So like NMES doesn't have to be used just for quad sets and just for straight leg raises and things like that. So early on, and I'll kind of show you guys a video of how I do this, um, this has been something that's been really beneficial for me. And obviously you always have to think about medical uh, limitations with these people, depending on the surgery they got, the graft, different things like that. But if it's possible, 60 degrees of knee flexion has worked really well. 
And then finally, where's our gap in the research? So I think what we don't know is the benefit of active contraction versus passive application. And this is something I would love to get your guys' thoughts on as well. Uh, Meredith and I talked a little bit about this. And I think in general, outside of pain being a limiting factor, I don't know if there's a ton of benefit for why you would have someone do passive without the active contraction with it. I think it makes sense that the patient, you would be in more involved and you would get kind of that descending input that way. Um, but there are some studies that support uses of both. And then the other thing that we aren't completely sure on is how often do you have to do it? What's like the minimally effective dose for it, right? So based on the systematic review in the CPG, the recommendation is to get the best effect is 20, 10 to 40 minute sessions, which first of all is a huge range, right? Um, up to one to three times per day and for 12 plus weeks. So obviously that would be great. I don't know how feasible that is for a lot of people. So we need more research to figure out what's our minimally effective dose for this intervention. So here are a couple of different videos. The first one here on the left, what I was trying to show is the setup for this is exactly the same. And I wanted to compare what a passive contraction with this look like versus an active contraction. So the first one, and I kind of jacked this up pretty high to try to uh, give you a good example of it. So the first one will be passive and the second one will be active. So this is the initial setup. You can see I'm struggling with a little bit of tetany here just on my own. <laughs> so this is the passive one and then it'll chill out and we'll do one more. We'll get a true strong contraction. So this is me activating with it. So you can see you get the immediate tetany and I think that's just a better quality contraction with it actively. Obviously I'm a healthy, well, somewhat healthy female uh, model for this. So um, it's a little different than if you had an actual ACL patient, but just the difference between it with the exact same level of stimulation. And then this other one on the left, this is what I was talking about as far as the 60 degrees of knee flexion. So what I've been doing is belting people to the table like this. And then again, this is the same exact level of current in intensity as the quad set was. And I think you can kind of compare and see how good of a contraction it is in that way. So the first one that they'll show you here is again, it's a passive one. You can kind of see my leg twitch too. So like, it's not, it's not outstanding, I would say by any means, but you get a little bit of contraction going on. And then the second one here is when I actively uh, contract with it. And you can see you get much more quad that way. So again, these are both at the same intensity, just different ways and different knee flexion. And again, I think this would be tough for someone, especially with bone patellar bone or something like that early on in rehab, but it's been working pretty well, especially with the hamstring and quad grafts that I've been getting. And you could definitely use it later too, um, but just different applications of it that way. So then this is one more study that I was like so jacked up about. You guys have, some of you may have heard me talk about it for Journal Club. So this was a study that looked at using this for longer than the six week period. So initially uh, what this was is it looked at three different groups. One group did standard ACL rehab. One group did standard ACL rehab with a progressive sit to stand routine. And then the final group did ACLs with sit to stands with the application of NMES. And what they looked at was quad girth, quad isometric strength measurements, and then sit to stand and jump mechanics, um, like with video analysis. So they had a wide range of different measures that way. Oh, my bad. So um, this was the intervention that they had here. Um, just to give you guys a general overview, for the first 15 days, everyone got NMES. So that was not something that was different between the studies. But then from day 15 to day 60 is when the groups kind of diverged. So at day 15, both groups started their progressive sit to stands. Um, and then the group that with, had the NMES was just set up like in the lower right hand corner here. Um, another reason I like this study is they progressively increased the eccentric component of the sit to stand group over the course of the rehab. So they started at three sets of six and worked up to three sets of 12. Uh, but the last week they had more heavy uh, eccentric. So they did six seconds of eccentric, two seconds of concentric. So that was kind of the setup for the study. And what you can see here is the results is the group with NMES uh, was statistically significantly better in quad strength at all time points. So this first graph looks at extension at 30 degrees of flexion and 90 degrees of flexion at day 60 and day 180. And in both groups, uh, this both sit to stand and NMES were greater than the ACL rehab alone, but the NMES was even farther superior as far as lens symmetry index goes. 
Um, when it came to the vertical forces, looking at the limb symmetry with squats and jumps, uh, the, there was not as great of a difference between the NMES and the sit to stand groups, but both of those were uh, superior to the normal rehab as well. So I think this is just an interesting study because it looks at how you can use it way longer in rehab and um, just play with using it as you get to higher level tasks. So this is another example. This is just one exercise that I picked. Um, you can use this basically with any end stage rehab, but the idea is you just perform your normal like eccentric movements, but you do it with the NMES on. So you get a little bit of that eccentric with the NMES contraction as well. And I've done it with this. Uh, you could do leg press, you could do step up, all of that. Um, this is a pretty hefty setup. Most of my patients have a home NMES unit, so they just clip it on their belt and it's a little more easy and functional. Um, but I don't have my own, so that's why I did this. Okay, so these are what, just talking to my coworkers as well, the greatest barriers to NMES in the clinic. The first one I would say is just provider knowledge. Uh, like I said, it's, a, it's an awkward tool for some people to use, and especially if they don't know much about it, a lot of my coworkers are kind of uncomfortable with it. So I think we're learning more from the CPGs and the different articles on how we can use it clinically. Um, another one I hear a lot when I talk about this with the docs as well is the cost to the patient. Um, and I do get this because it's a real thing. Um, these are the two options that we have at our clinic. The majority, I would say 80 to 90% of my patients end up getting this one from Amazon. That's $80. And I know there's differences between different home units, but this is just the one that's worked the best for me. Um, the other end of the spectrum is this fancy Evive brace. So I've had a few patients who get this and it's super patient friendly. They just, they just throw it on and they run through their programming. I don't actually like it that much because it's pretty stiff. So like you can't get an end range knee flexion with it. So it hasn't been super helpful. Um, and it doesn't have as much ability for like me as the provider to change the parameters. So that's one part that's kind of been a bummer, but that, that one costs $300. So I've only had a few people who have actually elected for that. The nice part of it is it does track their data in it, I guess. Um, so yeah, $80 is definitely something that for some patients won't work. Um, but the majority of mine luckily have been able to do that. And then finally, the last thing I've heard is like, it takes a long time to set up. And I think there's some like truth to this, especially early on, but I think you pay your time up front in teaching the patient how to do it and use it on their own. And I would say for the first two sessions, it's probably pretty clunky, but then by the time they get to their third and fourth session, like they can just flip it on and do it themselves and then clip it on their belt. And it literally takes like 30 seconds. So I agree like up front, it requires more education and time that way, but I don't think long term that's a, that should be a huge barrier to its use. So those are just some of my general thoughts. Um, as general key takeaways, I think there's level A and B evidence. So like at, at this point, I think it's kind of non-negotiable that people start using NMES. Um, and I think these are seen like benefits throughout all different types of knee surgeries as well. Uh, as far as patient comfort and parameters, biphasic seems to be the way to go with large electrodes just for patient comfort. But the main thing is you've got to keep increasing the amplitude in between sessions uh, to truly get the full effect. And then um, I would think about trying to use it, and I've been trying to use it well beyond that two to two week time frame just to get more benefit out of it. Um, and then we may not know the appropriate frequency of it, uh, but most of the research supports that it be done at least daily. So those are kind of some of my takeaways. There's a couple different discussion questions we have here, um, but uh, again, we can talk about whatever you guys are uh, interested in. But that is what I got for you guys. Hey, thanks, Bailey. I have a question to start out. So looking at the literature on this, it seems like some healthies too have like difficulty with what they define as a uh, full quad activation. Uh, so how are we assessing them clinically to say that they have adequate quad activation before we dismiss the NMES? Um, or are we just going to like just hammer it away constantly regardless throughout the whole uh, rehab stage stages? Yeah, so I, I've been just hammering it away until we got to the point where it became clunky and then I stopped using it for the movement training. Uh, the people at my work would tell you that they use it until a person can complete 20 straight leg raises. Um, I think that's kind of soft and I think there we can be better as far as that goes. Um, but I guess, yeah, I don't know a true good point where like we're okay to stop um, using it, but I think that's a good question. I think it brings. Oh, hey. <laughs> I think it brings up like a good question. Like, 
where does the harm come in and using it like you know overusing it so if i jump in here real quick to like answer the tail end of that is university of delaware their protocol is they stem until they're 80 percent quad index so we know symmetry isn't fantastic but if you're not at as far as their standards 80 percent symmetric then like you still need to be stronger and NMES is a way that they utilize that and input that. Now their protocol also requires 70% quad index before you run. So they generally probably use it on the longer end of the spectrum than most people are. Like I agree with Bailey that the 20 straight leg raises is a little soft. Um, and so one thing I challenge is like, so we can have good quad strength, but it doesn't mean you're using the quads during like your functional movements. So is it still useful to do NMES with other exercises? I think Bailey had some uh, studies and photos of them doing like a squat and such, but um, even progressions from that. And would that help the transfer, do you think, or is it more about motor learning context? I like it for I, I like it for even just during the heavy strength phases rather than just with the motor learning aspect of it, um, especially like stabilizing like especially with quad extensions I've noticed using it and especially if people have like patellar tendon pain for whatever reason with the application of the NMS I've had people who had less pain with that, so I think that's another cool way to use it because it just gives you that superimposed burst to try to get over the hump that way. But I don't know, Meredith, if you have other thoughts with that. No, I 100% agree. And the way I look at it is uh, athletes are really good compensators. And so they're going to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So if they have quad inhibition and you tell them to do a single leg squat, they're going to use more hamstring and glute to, and compensate with trunk and other mechanics and able to do that, right? But a lot of the time, the way we're looking at their mechanics and we're looking at, can they do it? We're not looking at how they do it, right? So if we manipulate our tasks to be more quad dominant, then that might exhibit some of these deficits that we see, or you, you'll you notice that when you strength test them, when you strength test them, that they have a deficit and then you'll continue to use NMES functionally, like Bailey has so kindly educated thanks guys and there's uh with emerging technology we'll call it uh there's the emergence of stuff like the power dot and compacts with like strength settings on it do you guys think that has the same settings as nmes really or do you is it just safer to use the actual machines that worth contacting the manufacturers what do you guys think so we use PowerDot at the high school I'm at. It's a Richie Rich high school. So we have like 12 of them there. So for whatever reason, that has been way easier to get a contraction on than the usual units that I'm using. Um, it is tough because there's just no ability to modify any parameters. So it scares me a little bit in that sense. Um, but for whatever reason, it's working better than what I'm doing in the clinic. So I don't know if that's a, something more about me as a provider or the device itself, but yeah, that was my experience with them. We use it at Exos a ton, but we cannot get the dang power dots to sync with any of our phones constantly. Um, but I'd say with Compax, I see what you're describing is Compax. I mean, we get the contraction so easily. That's why I'm just a bit skeptical that they have, it's some kind of setting where it's just, visually doing that but maybe not having the exact settings we wanted on that's why i was just curious um, can i can i make like a a point that bailey what bailey said was like so key like doing a contraction at 60 degrees no, so, no i'm kidding go ahead <laughs> if you 
like dive into that rice article and like even more recent articles like quad inhibition occurs most at end ranges of motion so if your patient is struggling to get a quad contraction day one right at end range extension even though you want them to so bad because you want to send them home with a quad set like it's okay to do an isometric contraction within their available range Okay, because it's probably going to have less inhibition neurologically than at end range of extension. Okay, and I think that that is something that I didn't, I didn't realize and I didn't catch on until I started to see it in the clinic. The other thing is that we did not talk about at all are other things you can do besides NMES right away. And those things are focal knee joint cooling. So literally just icing the knee joint itself okay, can increase spinal reflex excitability and give you about a 60 minute window to exercise with better spinal reflex, okay, early on. The other thing you can do is sensory tens. So this is an afferent disruption. It's an afferent inhibition issue, okay? So I need to, I need to jack up the afferent system and sensory tens can do that. Okay, so if you have somebody who especially, I'll use this week one, week two, where they are still really swollen and it hurts to get NMES on them. Instead of not doing NMES at all, I'll put on four electrodes around the joint and use sensory tens at a comfortable pace for them. And it really, truly helps them get a better clog contraction. Okay, so those are just some like clinical hacks. If you have difficulty with somebody who's uncomfortable or such right away using it, there's other ways you can still like jack up the system a little bit to impact it. Meredith, with the, uh, with the cooling stuff, so do you have them ice right before, you're not having them, are you having them activate while the ice is on or you ice then take the ice off then activate? You generally, you generally ice and then take it off and activate. The issue is you can't use like a, you can't use like a huge chiro cuff or like game ready or whatever. Like it has to be just to the joint. Like even if you get it really over the quad tendon, like of the quad is going to cause inhibition and it's going to make your problem worse. It really needs to be as focal as you can to the joint. So it's harder. My, my first goal if accessible is always tens just because it's easier. It's less finicky than I is. And I, I feel like they also get a pain modulation response too. So if there's somebody who has a lot of pain, then it's it's good for them. So Rick just said what I was thinking, is it good for an ice cup in that area than before? I, do, I honestly don't know the answer to that. Um, Cause that's very, I mean, it's superficial. I don't know, but it wouldn't be in my opinion or my head, the way I'm thinking of it would be no different than an ice bag, but most of the studies that have used it is, I don't think they use a cup. Okay. What what they use in the studies then, where is it? It's like a... Um, Just a shaped bag? Jelly, jelly packs. Right. Right. <laughs> what, are, right. what are those called? So I'm very slow. So let me get this straight. You're saying we should do the stuff we do at the end of therapy in the beginning. Before. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And people who like rag on ice... I'm like, no, but wait, it can help the spinal reflex in quad inhibition. So there's my one utility that I really like. But they'll never heal Meredith. Okay. <laughs> um, are there any other questions out there right now? Um, quick one for Meredith and or Bailey. So it seems like you guys do NMES with C and D extension. Do you find that you ramp down the total time on to be able to produce a more powerful contraction where you have them kick out faster and you want that contraction to be faster for more of a speed base as you advance to that looks like 80% quadriceps uh, hamstring ratio. Or I'm sorry, limb length or limb symmetry. Yeah, are you saying like the like switching out so that the tempo of it is shorter rather than yeah? So I started doing that. Uh, I I like just got super into NMES like three months ago, <laughs> so I'm pretty new to using it like it that excessively. But yeah, for I have a couple patients who are at that power point, and then I just really shortened down the uh, on time and then gave them more recovery with it. So I tried it with a couple people, but I don't have like extensive experience to support that by any means. Awesome. Thank you.
Meredith, I know you're in a rush, but I did want to say that you directly and quickly, uh, you directly and quickly uh, uh, gave affected my clinical practice because early rehab. Now I never use a foam roller or foam pad or anything like that um, until like midway through fellowship. I stopped using it. So thanks for that, and I taught my residents that too. So appreciate that. Thanks for passing along pa passing along that nugget. <laughs> well. I'm going to I'm going to jet to the Q&A session but thank you for having me and good job Bailey. You're doing fantastic. Thank Thanks you. For having and if anyone wants to join that if you scroll up in the chat you can find the link there too. Um anything else from anyone else though? All right, in that case, thanks again Bailey for going over all that. I remember our text convo just during those few months when you went crazy over this topic. So appreciate you sharing all that knowledge because I certainly didn't want to go through all that evidence too. Um, so next week we got Dan Lynch and um, oh my, Luke, Drew Lukes, Drew Lukes um, talking about late stage ACL rehab. And so stay peeled for the uh, email on that. But thanks again for everyone for joining and have a good evening. Thanks everybody.